The Holy Roman Empire came to a sort of climax in the reign of the Emperor Charles V. He was one of the most extraordinary monarchs that Europe has ever seen. For a time he had the air of being the greatest monarch since Charlemagne. His greatness was not of his own making. It was largely the creation of his grandfather, the Emperor Maximilian I, 1459-1519. Some families have fought, others have intrigued their way to world power. The Habsburgs married their way. Maximilian began his career with Austria, Styria, part of Alsac and other districts, the original Habsburg patrimony. He married, the lady's name scarcely matters to us, the Netherlands and Burgundy. Most of Burgundy slipped from him after his first wife's death, but the Netherlands he held. Then he tried unsuccessfully to marry Brittany. He became emperor in succession to his father Frederick III in 1493 and married the Duchy of Milan. Finally, he married his son to the weak-minded daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, the Ferdinand and Isabella of Columbus, who not only reigned over a freshly united Spain and over Sardinia and the kingdom of the two Sicilies, but over all America west of Brazil. So it was that this Charles V, his grandson, inherited most of the American continent and between a third and a half of what the Turks had left of Europe. He succeeded to the Netherlands in 1506. When his grandfather Ferdinand died in 1516, he became practically king of the Spanish dominions, his mother being imbecile, and his grandfather Maximilian dying in 1519, he was in 1520 elected emperor at the still comparatively tender age of 20. He was a fair young man with a not very intelligent face, a thick upper lip and a long clumsy chin. He found himself in a world of young and vigorous personalities. It was an age of brilliant young monarchs. Francis I had succeeded to the French throne in 1515 at the age of 21. Henry VIII had become King of England in 1509 at 18. It was the age of Babur in India, 1526 to 1530, and Suleiman the Magnificent in Turkey, 1520. Both exceptionally capable monarchs, and the Pope Leo X, 1513, was also a very distinguished Pope. The Pope and Francis I attempted to prevent the election of Charles as emperor because they dreaded the concentration of so much power in the hands of one man. Both Francis I and Henry VIII offered themselves to the imperial electors. But there was now a long-established tradition of Habsburg emperors since 1273, and some energetic bribery secured the election for Charles. At first the young man was very much a magnificent puppet in the hands of his ministers. Then slowly he began to assert himself and take control. He began to realize something of the threatening complexities of his exalted position. It was a position as unsound as it was splendid. From the very outset of his reign he was faced by the situation created by Luther's agitations in Germany. The emperor had one reason for siding with the reformers in the opposition of the pope to his election. But he had been brought up in Spain, that most Catholic of countries, and he decided against Luther. So he came into conflict with the Protestant princes, and particularly the elector of Saxony. He found himself in the presence of an opening rift that was to split the outworn fabric of Christendom into two contending camps. His attempts to close that rift were strenuous and honest, and ineffective. There was an extensive peasant revolt in Germany, which interwove with the general political and religious disturbance, and these internal troubles were complicated by attacks upon the empire from east and west alike. On the west of Charles was his spirited rival Francis I, to the east was the ever-advancing Turk, who was now in Hungary, in alliance with Francis, 
and clamoring for certain areas of tribute from the Austrian dominions. Charles had the money and army of Spain at his disposal, but it was extremely difficult to get any effective support in money from Germany. His social and political troubles were complicated by financial distresses. He was forced to ruin his borrowing. On the whole, Charles, in alliance with Henry VIII, was successful against Francis I and the Turk. Their chief battlefield was North Italy. The generalship was dull on both sides. Their advances and retreats depended mainly on the arrival of reinforcements. The German army invaded France, failed to take Marseilles, fell back into Italy, lost Milan, and was besieged in Pavia. Francis I made a long and unsuccessful siege of Pavia, was caught by fresh German forces, defeated, wounded, and taken prisoner. But thereupon the Pope and Henry VIII, still haunted by the fear of his attaining excessive power, turned against Charles. The German troops in Milan, under the constable of Bourbon, being unpaid, forced rather than followed their commander into a raid upon Rome. They stormed the city and pillaged it, 1527. The Pope took refuge in the castle of St. Angelo, while the looting and slaughter went on. He bought off the German troops at last by the payment of 400,000 ducats. Ten years of such confused fighting impoverished all Europe. At last the Emperor found himself triumphant in Italy. In 1530 he was crowned by the Pope. He was the last German Emperor to be so crowned at Bologna. Meanwhile, the Turks were making great headway in Hungary. They had defeated and killed the King of Hungary in 1526. They held Budapest, and in 1529, Suleiman the Magnificent very nearly took Vienna. The Emperor was greatly concerned by these advances, and did his utmost to drive back the Turks, but he found the greatest difficulty in getting the German princes to unite, even with this formidable enemy, upon their very borders. Francis I remained implacable for a time, and there was a new French war. But in 1538, Charles won his rival over to a more friendly attitude after ravaging the south of France. Francis and Charles then formed an alliance against the Turk. But the Protestant princes, the German princes who were resolved to break away from Rome, had formed a league, the Schmalkaldic League, against the Emperor and in the place of a great campaign to recover Hungary for Christendom, Charles had to turn his mind to the gathering internal struggle in Germany. Of that struggle he saw only the opening war. It was a struggle, a sanguinary irritational bickering of princes, for ascendancy, now flaming into war and destruction, now sinking back to intrigues and diplomacies. It was a snake's sack of princely policies, that was to go on writhing incurably right into the 19th century and to waste and desolate Central Europe again and again. The Emperor never seems to have grasped the true forces at work in these gathering troubles. He was for his time and station an exceptionally worthy man, and he seems to have taken the religious dissensions that were tearing Europe into warring fragments as genuine theological differences. He gathered diets and councils in futile attempts at reconciliation. Formula and confessions were tried over. The student of German history must struggle with the details of the religious peace of Nuremberg, the settlement at the Diet of Ratisbon, the interim of Augsburg, and the like. Here we do but mention them as details in the worried life of this culminating emperor. As a matter of fact, Hardly one of the multifarious princes and rulers in Europe seems to have been acting in good faith. The widespread religious trouble of the world, the desire of the common people for truth and social righteousness, the spreading knowledge of the time, all those things were merely counters in the imaginations of princely diplomacy. Henry VIII of England, who had begun his career with a book against heresy, and who had been rewarded by the Pope 
with the title of Defender of the Faith, being anxious to divorce his first wife in favor of a young lady named Anne Boleyn, and wishing also to loot the vast wealth of the church in England, joined the company of Protestant princes in 1530. Sweden, Denmark and Norway had already gone over to the Protestant side. The German religious war began in 1546, a few months after the death of Martin Luther. We need not trouble about the incidents of the campaign. The Protestant Saxon army was badly beaten at Lokau. By something very like a breach of faith, Philip of Hesse, the emperor's chief remaining antagonist, was caught and imprisoned, and the Turks were bought off by the promise of an annual tribute. In 1547, to the great relief of the emperor, Francis I died. So, by 1547, Charles got to a kind of settlement and made his last efforts to effect peace, where there was no peace. In 1552, all Germany was at war again. Only a precipitate flight from Innsbruck saved Charles from capture. And in 1552, with the Treaty of Passau, came another unstable equilibrium. Such is the brief outline of the politics of the empire for 32 years. It is interesting to note how entirely the European mind was concentrated upon the struggle for European ascendancy. Neither Turks, French, English, nor Germans had yet discovered any political interest in the great continent of America, nor any significance in the new sea routes to Asia. Great things were happening in America. Cortes, with a mere handful of men, had conquered the great Neolithic empire of Mexico for Spain. Pizarro had crossed the Isthmus of Panama, 1530, and subjugated another wonderland, Peru. But as yet these events meant no more to Europe than a useful and stimulating influx of silver to the Spanish treasury. It was after the Treaty of Passau that Charles began to display his distinctive originality of mind. He was now entirely bored and disillusioned by his imperial greatness. A sense of the intolerable futility of these European rivalries came upon him. He had never been of a very sound constitution. He was naturally indolent, and he was suffering greatly from gout. He abdicated. He made over all his sovereign rights in Germany to his brother Ferdinand, and Spain and the Netherlands he resigned to his son Philip. Then, in a sort of magnificent dungeon, he retired to a monastery at Eusti, among the oak and chestnut forests in the hills, to the north of the Tag of Swally. There he died in 1558. Much has been written in a sentimental vein of this retirement, this renunciation of the world by this tired majestic titan, world-weary, seeking in an austere solitude his peace with God. But his retreat was neither solitary nor austere. He had with him nearly a hundred and fifty attendants. His establishment had all the splendor and indulgences without the fatigues or a court. And Philip II was a dutiful son to whom his father's advice was a command. And if Charles had lost his living interest in the administration of European affairs, there were other motives of a more immediate sort to stir him, says Prescott, in the almost daily correspondence between Xixada or Gastelu and the Secretary of State at Valladolid, there is scarcely a letter that does not turn more or less on the Emperor's eating or his illness. The one seems naturally to follow, like a running commentary on the other. It is rare that such topics have formed the burden of communications with the Department of State. It must have been no easy matter for the secretary to preserve his gravity in the perusal of dispatches in which politics and gastronomy were so strangely mixed together. The courier from Valladolid to Lisbon was ordered to make a detour so as to take Charandula in his route and bring supplies to the royal table. On Thursdays he was to bring fish to serve for the jor mayor that was to follow. The trout in the neighborhood Charles thought too small, 
so others of a larger size were to be sent from Valladolid. Fish of every kind was to his taste, as indeed was anything that in its nature habits at all approach to fish. Eels, frogs, oysters occupied an important place in the royal bill of fare. Potted fish, especially anchovies, found great favor with him, and he regretted that he had not brought a better supply of these from the low countries. On an eel pasty he particularly doted. In 1554 Charles had obtained a bull from Pope Julius III, granting him a dispensation from fasting and allowing him to break his fast early in the morning, even when he was to take the sacrament. Eating and doctoring. It was a return to elemental things. He had never acquired the habit of reading, but he would be read aloud to at meals, after the fashion of Charlemagne, and would make what one narrator describes as a sweet and heavenly commentary. He also amused himself with mechanical toys, by listening to music or sermons, and by attending to the imperial business that still came drifting into him. The death of the empress, to whom he was greatly attached, had turned his mind towards religion, which in his case took a punctilious and ceremonial form. Every Friday in Lent, he scorched himself with the rest of the monks with such good will as to draw blood. These exercises and the gout released a bigotry in Charles that had hitherto been restrained by considerations of policy. The appearance of Protestant teaching close at hand in Valladolid roused him to fury. Tell the Grand Inquisitor and his council from me to be at their post and to lay the axe at the root of the evil before it spreads further. He expressed a doubt whether it would not be well, in so black an affair, to dispense with an ordinary court of justice and to show no mercy, lest the criminal, if pardoned, should have the opportunity of repeating his crime. He recommended as an example his own mode or proceeding in the Netherlands, where all who remained obstinate in their errors were burned alive, and those who were admitted to penitence were beheaded. And almost symbolical of his place and role in history was his preoccupation with funerals. He seems to have had an intuition that something great was dead in Europe and sorely needed burial and there was need to write finis overdue. He not only attended every actual funeral that was celebrated at Eusti, but he had services conducted for the absent dead. He held a funeral service in memory of his wife on the anniversary of her death, and finally he celebrated his own obsequies. The chapel was hung with black, and the blaze of hundreds of wax lights was scarcely sufficient to dispel the darkness. The brethren in their conventual dress, and all the emperor's household clad in deep mourning, gathered round a huge catafalque, shrouded also in black, which had been raised in the center of the chapel. The service for the burial of the dead was then performed, and amidst the dismal wail of the monks, the prayers ascended for the departed spirit, that it might be received into the mansions of the blessed. The sorrowful attendants were melted to tears, as the image of their master's death was presented to their minds, or they were touched, it may be, with compassion, by this pitiable display of weakness. Charles, muffled in a dark mantle, and bearing a lighted candle in his hand, mingled with his household, the spectator of his own obsequies, and the doleful ceremony was concluded by his placing the taper in the hands of the priest, in sign of his surrendering up his soul to the Almighty. Within two months of this masquerade he was dead, and the brief greatness of the Holy Roman Empire died with him. His realm was already divided between his brother and his son. The Holy Roman Empire struggled on, indeed, to the days of Napoleon I, but as an invalid and dying thing. To this day, its unburied tradition still poisons the political air. Mm-hmm.